Hey Axis and Allies players, this is the Good Captain. Welcome to another video on Axis and Allies. Okay, so this is a pretty special video for me because this will be the first time that I'm not talking about Axis and Allies Classic. Obviously I'll be talking about Europe and Pacific 1940 and more specifically I'll be reviewing the customizations I've made to both of my out-of-box games here. So uh, a quick agenda of how this is going to work. I We'll start by reviewing the infrastructure and the changes that I've made, and then I'll go through power by power after that until they're all done, and then we'll go ahead and set up the whole board so we can see how it looks. Now, I have gone out of my way, insofar as I was able, to make sure that I'm not reviewing things that have already been touched on by other Axis and Allies YouTubers and customizers, okay? So I think I've got some fresh concepts, so please stick around and let me know what you think. Um, but uh, there were three operating principles that I really quickly want to review before we get to the actual showcasing of the pieces and those the first one was relatability. Relatability to me was key. I didn't want to do anything to my board or my pieces that would make it difficult for a novice player to understand what was going on so I'll just get rid of this right now. I did not paint period correct camouflage in any of my pieces. I didn't put any extra colors on the board, frankly, at all. I, I have a problem with color, what I call color noise, on customized Axis and Allies boards. I think there's a, a good reason that everything comes color-coded. So, um, yeah, there, I'll just get that out of the way. Relatability was first and foremost in my mind. Uh, the second thing was playability slash functionality. I wouldn't do anything that wasn't going to help or enhance the playability or functionality of this game. And last was historical accuracy. So these are in order. So if I could, I would try to correct historical wrongs when and if they popped up. So those were the three operating principles that I used to modify and enhance my out-of-box games. So I uh, hope you enjoy this, and here we go. So first, I'm going to introduce the facilities here. Uh, global, or Europe and Pacific, 1940, I should say, both come with these little chits that represent the facilities, and there are industrial complexes, air bases, and naval bases. And these are a, an inconvenient piece. They're very small, hard to see, and they get knocked around fairly easily. And one of the popular methods to quote unquote alleviate this issue is to literally print the these chits into the map. Uh, once a facility is constructed, it can't be destroyed. So, uh, for instance, the United Kingdom has a, a major industrial complex, an air base, and a naval base. So it will start out with all three of these printed in the UK uh, territory, the England territory. So. That's one way of doing it, but for me, it didn't solve the issue of visibility. It also is, it's very not like Axis and Allies to have facilities be represented by cardboard chits rather than actual 3D piece. The very first Axis and Allies, for instance, had its facilities represented by all white, which represented their common usage by all powers pieces. So there's an AA gun and an industrial complex and they just printed in all white. And that's kind of what I was going for here. So my solution was to use three pieces from uh, Shapeways. So the naval base, the air base, and the minor industrial complex. I would have done their major industrial complex but it was huge and so I went with the major industrial complex from historical board gaming. So I just want to put a flag there right now. Once we get to the end of this uh, video series on my board here, I'll lay out the whole thing and you'll really see how the color and the 3D nature of these really help these very crucial uh, pieces in the game pop out so that there's no confusion about what is where. Okay, so let's move on to the Russians as the first power for review. So the first power I'm going to review is Russia, and 
That's because I really have no qualms with any pieces that were selected to represent Russian units. I think this is immaculately well done and represented. So I, I can't say that for any, really, well, the Italians, but I can, can't say that for most of the other powers. But um, this gives me a good opportunity to sort of go over some general concepts that I applied to every power in the game. And the first is color matching. So I did paint my pieces, but I just painted them in the same color as the out of box. So uh, I used a dull, well, I'll just show you. I used Tamiya, right? Not gloss, nothing shines in war. <laughs> so I, I, this is an old transport from a first edition, 1940, just to show you that this is the color I was trying to match. It's not perfect for the Russians, but uh, it's close enough. And I got it much closer with the other powers, as you'll see. Anyway, I did this uniformity be for two very related reasons. One, I wanted my pieces to be relatable to anybody. So even a novice player would have no problem seeing my board and relating to it immediately. Uh, the other reason is because I feel like, I feel very strongly that if you paint all your pieces in period correct camo, you're giving yourself a home field advantage. And I'll give you a quick caveat of something that just happened to me recently in the tournament in L.A. Uh, back in February to give an example. But I know this has happened. I've seen this happen to other players, and I've had other people tell me that this has happened to them as well. So folks who customize and paint colors all over their pieces, uh, those are their babies, right? They know what they what that is, what that represents. But unless you were directly involved in that process, you're you're playing somebody who doesn't wasn't involved in that process. Then, by some degree, you you have an advantage in that it takes that person's brain at least some mental work to figure out what's what and where where things are on the map. And my personal example, most recently, is I had a re really nasty can opener done to me as Russia. I was the Russian player, an Italian tank opened up a hole and the Germans punched through and it was only because I, I couldn't distinguish one tank from another in that mass on the Eastern Front. So I felt that was more than a cheesy move and I really didn't want that to happen to my opponent or to me with my set and it won't now because everything's painted uniform. So that's one. Uh, aspect. The other is mold lines, and I'm going to very quickly show you what mold lines are. Using an old piece from a 19, uh, late 90s version of Axis and Allies Europe, that's this color, the funky color the Russians came in back then. You can see this line running down the center of the bottom of the tank, and notice that I've removed that. Uh, how did I do that? Well, I used what's called sanding twigs, and the only reason I'm taking time to explain this is because I haven't seen anybody else on any forums or on any Axis and Allies videos explain how they did this. So these are sanding twigs and these are well-worn sanding twigs. And if I can, I'll link these in the description below if you like what you see here. And what you do is just take a coarse-grained sanding stick and start by slowly sanding it down until this uh, just goes away, basically. Right? You, you want to have it look you know, scratched out, basically. So you'll do this, and this takes time. You just got to come home and put it on, put on your favorite podcast, and uh, what you'll do is slowly move to a finer grain. Once you've taken the mold line off, you move to a finer grain, and everything's color coded. That's each color represents a different grain of sanding twig until it's flat and smooth. And I did this to every piece in the in my original in my game out of box piece and in my second edition game. Um, and so here's the mechanized infantry for the Russians. Notice no mold line. Okay, so from time to time I'll put these up to the camera with each different power. But that's what I did and how I did it. And that is where I spent my time. Instead of painting camouflage or color identification markers on all my units, I put my time into destroying mold lines. Um, and, and every unit has them when they're out of box, but none of my units do now. And so. I will pull every power's submarine up because the submarines benefit so much from having the mold lines removed. They, they look much better without them. And this is especially true for the German U-boat. We'll get to, that, get to that in another segment. 
So I color matched everything, I removed all the mold lines and uh, for every power, and then every power I put um, aircraft on flight stands and, and decals as well. And the only reason I went here with them is because you know, novice players, again, with novice players in mind, you don't want to ever... <laughs> these should not, don't deserve to be on the ground because these units are so powerful. So if you have a little, especially like, let's say this little Russian fighter, I don't want anybody to forget that that's there. But when they're on a flight stand with decals, no, you don't have an excuse. And the strat bombers sit higher than the regular ones on, on the same uh, train of thought there, right? So, oh, sorry. So strat bombers should be a little bit more visible. So I got them on a higher flight stand. Um, and one thing I'll add to the marketplace of ideas in regards to Axis and Allies is... If you, if you decide to make your aircraft interchangeable, like you want to use the magnets to magnetize them, but not glue them onto the flight stand, and you also want to make them fly level, in other words, none of my, none of my planes are anything other than perfectly flying in level flight, and they'll do so on every flight stand. How did you do that? I do think I have something to offer here. A lot of it has to do with this tool. This is a pin drill. This is a two millimeter bit for a pin drill. You should be able to get this at a hobby store or Home Depot. Then you'll drill a small hole in the bottom center of gravity, or where the center of gravity is on the bottom of your aircraft, which is usually where the wing root meets the fuselage. And then you'll drill uh, a small hole. But before you even test fit the magnet, you're gonna do this. I, I don't know how else to explain it other than to show you. You're gonna drill at an angle, just a few turns, let's get that, left, right, front, and rear, like that. And you won't really notice much, it won't look very different, but what you've done is opened up that hole. This allows you to take a two millimeter magnet, place it on the top of the flight stand, right, pop, just use your imagination, pretend a magnet's there now. We put a little dab of glue on top, and what'll happen is you'll be able to mount the aircraft but the magnet will stay it won't get frozen in the bottom of the aircraft and you'll be able to do this you'll be able to move the aircraft around in a, in a in a way that you can get it just the way you want front and side to fly perfectly level and then you can let it go and let it dry okay and that's this is the end result no nothing cockeyed and oh, sorry so this is so you can see that this is perfectly interchangeable with any other flight stand. Okay, so if you're willing to spend a little time, it is simple, it's just tedious, okay? And so all my aircraft fly perfectly level on any flight stand. So there's a couple other modifications, techniques I'll talk about, but they're much faster and I'll incorporate them into future videos. This one's long enough, this segment's long enough, so let's move on to Italy. So the Italians are much like the Russians in that I had nothing but great things to say about each unit um, selected to represent Italian pieces in this game, especially the aircraft. And in fact, we'll start with the aircraft. I'm going to say something about the decals. I, I went with period correct decals on these aircraft. So this is what the Italians had on their aircraft in World War II. This will come up again, especially with Britain, but, uh, okay, so I, it's a, a small thing that I could do without violating any of my principles to get a little bit of historical accuracy in there. So I thought that was a neat addition. Um, and then I also magnetized my aircraft to the flight decks. This is a fairly standard procedure for a lot of customizers. Um, so I'll just go ahead and put my tactical bomber and fighter on this aircraft carrier because I want to show you something that I else kind of neat that I did and that is that let's move the light a little bit okay every aircraft fits perfectly on my flight deck and I did nothing to modify the aircraft so what I mean by that is that this this tactical bomber sits with its engines mounted on either side of the aircraft carrier when it lands on the front part of the deck and notice that the tail section 
doesn't even touch the island. Okay, so if we switch places, there's not going to be any conflict either. So I, this, this is me carefully placing the magnets in the hull of each capital or in each aircraft carrier, and I did this for every single power. And I'm going to especially brag about what I did with Japan when we get to Japan towards the end. But I just wanted to show that. Uh, if you want to know how to mount magnets, uh, there's plenty of other Axis and Allies players that uh, customizers that have you know have great videos that can show you how to do it. I did nothing special in that regards. But I will say uh, I did add one other element into my capital ships in regards to magnets. And actually, before I get to that, I will say about the Aquila class aircraft carrier. Um, some of the aircraft carriers came with hollowed out bottoms. Anzac did, and so did Italy. And um, what I did is filled it. I actually filled this with JB Weld. It's a little aggressive, I know, but I wanted to be. I wanted my stuff to be durable, and I was confident in what I was doing. So JB Weld did that thing shut. And then I put the two millimeter mag, uh, two millimeter magnet here. Now, why did I do that? Well, one of the few, I didn't. This isn't a game piece, but this is a supplementary game aid uh, that I used from historical board gaming. This is a damage token. Notice there's a two millimeter magnet in here, and that's because all my capital ships pair with the magnet on the bottom, paired and centered. Okay. So the battleships also have this, and this is for every power. So you can see the battleship. So if it's if it's if a ship a capital ship gets damaged, you don't have to turn it on its side. You can just use one of these tokens. This is the this is really a very rare exception for me. Again, I'm trying to c control how much color is on the game board so it's not confusing to new players. So yes, adding in this orange is a little extra. Just like the infrastructure being all white and kind of standing out, this is the this is the only other color on the board other than the original out of box colors for each power and the white infrastructure that will appear. This is the this is the end of the line for that. Everything else is going to look super basic. A lot of hard work went into my pieces, but it, it's meant to look. It's meant to be very subtle. There's a lot of integrity with my game pieces and my game setup, and um, you'll see all that when it, we tie it together at the end. But yeah, these were the Italians. Uh, I will showcase two pieces up close. One is the uh, mechanized infantry because this truck had a nasty, crazy mold line going down the uh, the center of it there, but it looks much better now without it, right? So that was pretty cool. And of course, the submarines. The submarines always look so much better with their mold lines gone. I mean, really, look at that sucker. That is a that is a high quality looking piece. <laughs> so okay, that's it for Italy.